And again, my name is, I'm, is Steve Lubliner. Uh, I'm a longtime National Association of Rocketry member, number 22152. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm actually a mechanical engineer by degree from the University of Delaware. And my electronics knowledge is basically from my rocketry hobby work and on the job training as a test engineer. Um, semi-retired right now. I actually retired and then went back to work. Uh, my test experience includes electromagnetic and environmental testing. The environmental testing is things like vibration, temperature, some more interesting tests like uh, hail and rain. The electromagnetics, we'll talk about some of the terms, electromagnetic vulnerability, um, electromagnetic interference testing. Uh, from a test standpoint, I've actually done the planning for program executions of tests, and that's actually hands-on uh, twiddling the buttons and watching the results. And yes, I have generated smoke during some of my previous testing. Uh, experience uh, primarily with the cruise missile world and with smart bombs. And that also includes instrumentation for those weapons and telemetry uh, on those weapons. I have about 50 years in hobby rocketry. Uh, I was the original author of the current NAR high power certification programs. Um, the current, uh, the creator and also the maintainer of the NARS Train Safety Officer Program. Uh, I am level three certified and the founder of the NARS L3CC or level three certification committee. And also I'm the NARS Safety Committee Chairman. Uh, so this subject is near and dear to my heart because in participating both in reviewing technical papers uh, for this event and also reviewing rockets for the NASA St Student Launch Initiative, seen a number of areas where we can improve our construction and layouts to make the rockets more resistant to electromagnetic environmental effects. Going on to the next slide. So we're gonna talk about what is E cubed or E3 some of the definitions of e cubed terms, uh, what some of the issues are relative to hobby rocketry, uh, techniques, how to minimize issues, and any other considerations. And again, uh, these environments are just as important in our rockets as the physical environments. We worry about shocks and acceleration, but these environments can just as easily cause rocket failures. Okay. Electromagnetic environments, they can be global, they can be local, or they can be internal to your rocket. Uh, one of the main uh, examples of a global environment is lightning. Uh, there are others, uh, the aurora, you know, atmospheric disturbances, uh, some local environments, power lines, uh, nearby radios and TV transmitters, and we'll talk about that. Uh, handheld devices, it's almost impossible to go on a rocket range anymore where people are not carrying cell phones. Uh, remote control devices, wireless launch systems. And then we have all the stuff we're putting within our rockets, uh, equipment that is digital processing, uh, telemetry and computer type stuff, uh, altimeters, uh, Arduinos, all of that being digital. Uh, switches, uh, relays and mechanical switches do create noise when they're switching. You get on uh, current design radios or what they call super heterodyne radios. They use mixing of frequencies to isolate what they're trying to bring out. So there are other frequencies generated within radios, electric motors, and I'm gonna demonstrate that in a little bit. Of course, there's transmitters in the field and there's electrostatic discharge. And again, we're primarily interested in the internal environments and how we lay out our rockets. But during preparation, setting up on launch pads, uh, we can't ignore the local environments. 
And E cubed, some of the uh, areas that are all contained within the E cubed banner. So electromagnetic compatibility, or as I say, somewhat tongue, tongue in cheek, can we all get along? And basically is you have various systems on your rockets. You may have altimeters, you may have staging mechanisms, uh, you have GPS. And the question is, do they all play well together? or are they stepping on each other? And as far as stepping on each other, that takes us to the next line, electromagnetic interference. Uh, a little bit tongue in cheek there, but are you interfering with me or are you bothering me? There is a specialized area of electromagnetic uh, environmental effects called HERO, which stands for Hazards of Electromagnetic Radiation on Ordnance. And basically, explosives can be triggered in a radio environment, especially on the military systems that operate in the proximity of very powerful radars. Uh, we have had uh, examples where radars and strong fields have fired ordnance or uh, pyrotechnics. Another example that you may have seen as you're going down the highway would be blasting area, you know, not to use radio equipment, radio transmitters within a blasting area. Electromagnetic vulnerability is basically, I'm searching out, are there signals where you may be vulnerable and not operate properly? Now, it could be intentional in the, say, the form of jammers, but it could be unintentional where you have a device that's creating uh, other um, frequencies, and it is affecting equipment nearby. Electrostatic discharge, also known as static electricity. I'm sure we've all been zapped by the doorknob at some point in time. Again, lightning is a specialized field. Uh, there's probably about at least three or four different elements of lightning and probably more. It's a very complex, very specialized field. Although for rocketry, it's basically stay out of it. Magnetic fields, uh, in some of the programs I've worked on on ships, they are exposed to electromagnetic fields to degauss the ships or demagnetize the ships. Uh, that's really not too much of a problem for us, but be aware if you have motors within your uh, rocket. Electromagnetic pulse. If you're worried about electromagnetic pulse, you've got big problems. Generally, electromagnetic pulse is associated with nuclear weapons. So we obviously are not gonna consider EMP. But again, what we are interested in is what's the sources of interference, how to mitigate them, and what's the compatibility of our electronic systems. The there, I, again, I've got professional background uh, electromagnetic testing. Uh, there's a couple specs and the like which offer regulations. In the case of the first one there, MIL standard 464. Again, it's intended for military systems, military sized threats, radars that have hundreds and thousands of watts and maybe if, even more than that of power. But there are some anecdotal data in the appendices that uh, may assist with your E-cubed understanding. So it could be some good reading in that uh, standpoint. A lot of stuff in there too about lightning, if you were wondering about the complexity of lightning. There's a commercial specification, the D0160. I haven't worked with it that much myself. Uh, but again, it covers both electromagnetic testing and physical environments like temperature and vibration. Uh, in the testing world, we nickname temperature and vibration, we call it the shake and bake type testing. The Code of Federal Regulations, I'm sure everybody has picked up or a piece of equipment that is identified with uh, CFR Part 15. And this covers basically low power and spurious emissions for if they're not well shielded, 
they put out a lot of electromagnetic interference on the early PCs back in the late 70s. Uh, there was actually people that wrote nonsense programs for the computer uh, because the electromagnetic noise from the computer, they could play music on an adjacent radio uh, by making un, uh, nonsense programs, basically. And if you're interested in going further, uh, it is useful for hobby rocketry. Consider a ham radio license uh, because that will get you permission to operate on various frequency bands and also with greater power. Uh, one of the examples would be the uh, Telemetrum. There, a lot of their equipment is for licensed operators. And one other thing too is that I will apologize to those who are outside the United States um, that again, the regulations and the like that I'm citing, the frequency bands, uh, I am US centric on this. I'm not familiar with the requirements in other countries. Uh, my suggestion would be is to, is to look to see what is, what are the regulations in your country. Some of the definitions that we'll get into here uh, is radiated uh, emissions, what goes over the air or through space, what are conducted emissions, typically along wires, um, and they may be receivers or, uh, well, our receivers could be antennas or the wiring. Susceptibility. Uh, is there going to be abnormal operation caused by the presence of external signals, either radiated or conducted? We're going to demonstrate some of this. Emissions, it's the output of signals. They could be intentional, like from a radio transmitter, or they can be spurious, like noise from an internal oscillator. And we typically combine these terms as radiated susceptibility, conducted susceptibility, radiated emissions, and conducted emissions. Again, we need to consider all the connected devices, the external and internal signal sources, and the intentional and spurious emitters. So getting into rocketry, what is our problem? And an example here, this is from the egg timer, a Wi-Fi switch, and I'm not picking on egg timer. They build some excellent products there. Uh, but they do warn because of the category and the way their equipment is designed of a potential interference problem. For example, on the Wi-Fi switch, they tell you that their device complies with Part 15 of the FCC rules. However, because it's Part 15, the device may not cause harmful interference and the device must accept any interference received. And this is key here interference that may cause undesired operation. Uh, again, uh, for the egg timer, they're primarily wanting us to use this equipment in high power rockets. And those are the ones that are within the FAR part 101. They'd like you to be at least 1500 feet away from populated buildings. But the key to us is since we're operating on the 2.4 gigahertz band, uh, there's a potential that both equipment that's on that band will interfere with us, and there's a potential that we could interfere with equipment that is not part of our operation. Just to show what's in there, I've identified the Wi-Fi, and that's running from about 2,400 megahertz to tw almost 2,500 megahertz. There's a small pocket in there that's for industrial, scientific, and medical use. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot going on within that red box for various people operating within that band. And again, on the egg timer, you have to accept interference from the other people on that band, and you cannot interfere with those people. And uh, the picture here I'm showing uh, gives an idea. I'm sure you're all familiar with all the paraphernalia that gets onto a, into a prep area 
as you can see, the rocket is fairly dense with rockets, with uh, electronics, and not so much in this photo, but there's a whole bunch of auxiliary electronic equipment. There's a lot of stuff on our ranges, again, in the different frequencies. Uh, the AM broadcast band is at the low end. Uh, if people are still using citizens band radio, uh, you're getting that into what's called high frequency. We start talking in the VHF world, our FM broadcast radio is in the VHF world. You have ham radio operators in the 50 to 54 megahertz range. And that includes some radio control operations that they're permitted to do. There's other radio control in the 72, the 75 megahertz. You have ham radio operators and some of the license-free part 15 transmitters operate at 315 megahertz. Again, you've got the ultra high frequency or UHF, you see some unlicensed part 15 stuff, uh, which is the 433 megahertz band. You've got hams operating between 420 and 450 megahertz. Uh, you have uh, FRS, GMRS radio folks. Those are typically, in the case of FRS, unlicensed. Uh, you have license-free transmitters at 915. You have more ham radio. GPS, the L1 frequency, which is the one we typically use, is at 1575 megahertz. You have some of the older G3, 3G cell phones in the 800 to 1900 range. A lot of 4G LTE stuff in the ultra high frequency. And of course the Wi-Fi. plus I also added it's at five gigahertz. So our hobby ranges are electrically noisy. Also, you may think, and we'll talk about harmonics here. So you have a radio that transmits at 50 megahertz. Uh, you're not a threat to anybody else out there. Well, there's something called harmonics, depending upon how pure your signal is. And you start getting into the Fourier transforms is the mathematical theory behind this. And the harmonics are whole number multiples of your primary frequency. So as the example says here, if I have a fundamental frequency of 300 megahertz, I'll have a second harmonic at 600 megahertz third harmonic at 900 megahertz. And I'm gonna demonstrate that shortly, but keep in mind you, you are radiating potentially on other frequencies. Uh, generally, everything that you're going to be operating will have harmonics to it, unless you had an absolutely perfect sine wave. Uh, some of the waveforms are very bad for having harmonics. Uh, basically things like square waves, sawtooth, triangular waves. If you think of those waves as being an addition, the addition of sine waves at various frequencies, uh, you can show how that makes the construct to ultimately get to a square wave. Uh, an example on that is a friend of mine had a railroad set where he did what was called constant lighting where he basically had an AC signal over the rails and the motors, the DC motors on the locomotives did not react to it, but the lighting would react to the AC signal. What he didn't realize was that his 200 feet of track that he had there was one giant antenna and he was blocking out a lot of stuff within their house. So again, the digital devices are especially bad in this area. Um, if they're not shielded or not isolated, you could have frequencies that will upset adjacent devices. You need to consider the harmonics as causes of electronic interference, electromagnetic interference. So I'm about to show a video, a couple specifics about the video. Uh, the Cox transmitter I'm using broadcasts on 27 megahertz. The second harmonic is about 54 megahertz, and that's channel two on the old broadcast television. The fourth harmonic is about 108 megahertz, and that's on the FM broadcast band. 
And the sixth harmonic is at about 162 megahertz. And that's on the NOAA Weather Channel band. So I'm going to switch out of this mode for a moment. I'm going to look at the um, my basically the uh, dashboard for this presentation, see if there's any questions or issues, and then I'm going to switch over to the video. Okay, as far as I can tell, no one has sent me any questions, so I'll call that a good thing or a bad thing if no one's listening. Uh, I'm going to go on over now to one of the videos. And we're going to start this video, and this is on harmonics. In this section, I want to talk about harmonics. The cadet radio control unit here is identified as transmitting on channel 3. And channel 3 is 27.095 megahertz. If we multiply that by 2, or the second harmonic, that's approximately 54 megahertz, which is approximately the same as channel 2 on the old st old style televisions so as you can see here i have my radio the selector switch on it set for the top there which is tv two to eight two to six so let's go ahead and turn everything on you can see roughly where i have things tuned and let's go ahead and see what we can sh uh, what happens here so the radio is on the radio control, and now the radio. And you can hear that there's noise there, just to show that it is the RC. But turn the RC off, the noise goes away, turn it back on. And I can also change the sound by uh, giving uh, commands to the radio. So let's go ahead now, and let's switch to We're going to go on to the weather band. Weather band goes from 162.4 to 162.550. The sixth harmonic on this radio will be equal to 162.570. So just outside the weather band. And let's, let's see what happens. Again, we got all kinds of noise. If I turn it off, the noise goes away. If I turn the radio back on, the noise is back. And this is on the weather band, as you can see here, where I've got it, the selector right now. So let's go one other place. Let's go to the FM band. And four times 27 is about 108. So it's at the very high end of the FM band. And let's go ahead and tune this radio. For 108 megahertz, roughly. Turn it off and the noise goes away. Turn it on and we have the noise back. And you can hear me changing the, the pitch a little bit with the radio control. Again, the purpose of, and this was FM, showing it in the thing there. And again, the purpose of this was to show the significance of harmonics. Even though the radio is actually transmitting at 27, because it's not a perfectly clean sine wave, there are other signals being broadcast on this radio on integer multiples of the primary frequency. Okay, I'm going to go on back now into the uh, PowerPoint. And that was on harmonics. 
Uh, again, uh, just showing uh, the variety of equipment. You'll notice on the picture there, all the um, electronics in the background, the computers. Uh, we're gonna talk about now conducted interference and we're gonna talk about radiated interference. So I'm gonna show the two videos back to back. The first video will be the conducted interference and the second video will be the radiated interference. And these are both fairly short. They're less than two minutes each. This is a brief uh, video demonstration of conducted interference. I'm using the radio, which I'm turning on right now as the indicator so we just have some static where i've tuned it to a station or lack of station i'm going to turn on the radio control transmitter and basically not a whole lot of difference and it doesn't share power now i'm going to turn on the radio control equipment and there's uh, obviously an effect here i'm also going to go ahead and control hear that it's speeding back into the system here. okay I'm gonna go ahead now and disconnect the radio from this power and I'm gonna go ahead and give it its own power You'll notice that you don't hear the noise as I control on the radio right now. Uh, basically, the noise was coming through the wiring and through the power circuit. So this was an example of conducted uh, interference. This demonstration is just a brief demonstration of radiated interference. My noisemaker for radiated interference is this motor, uh, brush type motors, especially cheap ones, put out a lot of sparks, which creates a lot of radio interference. The radio is set on AM band, so it's gonna be more susceptible to it. And right now the radio control is on you can see it moving there not hearing any real noise or anything on the radio let's go ahead and turn on the small motor and of course it is very loud i'm going to turn the radio down you hear the motor running but more important i'm going to put the motor next to the servo and you can see its operation is causing the servo to move in fact it's so bad i can't even control the servo i'm going to turn the motor off and i have normal control of the servo this is a demonstration of radiated emissions And I'm going to go back into the PowerPoint now. Okay. So just a graphic, basically, this is kind of a classic graphic. If you're used to the old time CRT televisions, now, somebody using an electric drill in the house, the emissions, the radio emissions can be radiated from the drill motor, as an example, for interference and picked up by the antennas on the television, or the noise travels through the power wiring, uh, through the wall outlet, through the house wiring, and gets into the TV that way. So just a simple graphic of the radiated and conducted interference.
Uh, we also talk a little bit about magnetic fields, uh, primarily caused by electromechanical devices, motors, and solenoids. Uh, they can interfere with magnet operated switches. Um, a lot of the newer devices nowadays are Hall effect transistors, which pick up, which react to magnetism. Uh, some folks might still use old style reed switches. Uh, again, they would have other issues, they're relatively fragile. Um, but they're both magnetically operated switches. You know, keep the device, devices separated from the magnetic um, source. The field orientation may also help if you can change the orientation of the source. You can also shield the magnetic source or shield the component from the magnetic source. One of the more popular shielding metals is called mu metal. Uh, there's other uh, metals for magnetic shielding uh, called Giron and Magnet Shield. And again, remember that some of these are just nuisances, but some of these effects are true safety hazards. So the adverse effects we worry about here, uh, noise in the video and video, unusual or failed computer st uh, startup, the electromagnetic radiation uh, while the computer is bootstrapping, or doing its power on testing. Uh, potentially you could interrupt that process and the computer will have a, a unique un, unplanned boot up or it may not boot up at all. We talked about the hero earlier. There is the possibility of uncommanded firing of pyrotechnics. Uh, I did try a little bit with my ham radio about a two watt output to try to set off a flash bulb. Uh, I was not successful with that which is a, but keep in mind that radio transmissions and pyrotechnics are not a good mix. And also you could affect logic and switching circuitry controlling the pyrotechnics. Uh, I just did a bare flash bulb with wiring. You take something like a MOSFET, which is a voltage operated device. And depending upon the circuitry controlling the MOSFET, you could fire a pyrotechnics. Uh, uncommanded power control of onboard electronics. Uh, we demonstrated earlier the operation, unwanted operation of uh, electromechanical devices. Uh, for example, uh, there's a gentleman doing thrust vector control work, uh, Joe Bertrand, very, uh, very good videos, I might add, if you could look at his webpage. And the servos in his system could be impacted by electromagnetic noise, also interference with receivers. The GPS signals are very weak. So if you are interfering, you have a potential that it may take it a long time to get it for its first fix, or it may never get a first fix. So elimination. Okay, conducted interference, the best bet is separate your power sources. Um, I saw at least one of the technical reports, someone was using, using a common power source for their telemetry and uh, one of their ejection systems. Uh, I wasn't real happy with that. I like to see, first off for reliability, um, independent power for ejection systems. So if something goes wrong with the telemetry, like a short, it doesn't take out the recovery system, but also any noise between the two systems doesn't crosstalk. Uh, just also, it's very common to separate your power and your signal conductors. That servo example I showed earlier, it had the control signal, the six volt DC, and the returns running in parallel to each other. Would have been better to twist and pair that wiring or even divorce the two sets of wires. Uh, there's filter design. You may have noticed on some radio control airplanes and other applications with motors, there's capacitors across the power leads that try to absorb some of that noise energy. Uh, it's somewhat of an art. It's somewhat of a trial and error pr process, uh, but definitely filters are a way of approaching the problem. But the easiest way is separate power sources. As you saw in the demo, when I powered the FM radio separately from the servo system. Uh, it radiated interference, 
Most popular and easiest way is twisted pair wiring, uh, shielded conductors. As you can see in the picture here, you have multiple twisted pairs, and then this is overall shielded. Depending upon the wiring that you specify, you could have individual pairs of wires or even single conductors that are shielded. Uh, for radio frequency type work, like leads to antennas, you can use coaxial cable where you have the signal lead in the center, you have shields, and then a protective covering. And the shield is also a return in many cases. Uh, and also keep your wire lengths as short as possible. Uh, I've seen folks that have just taken and just basically rolled up into a coil the wires and stowed the wires uh, somewhere within the rocket. Not a good practice. Uh, we do understand that you do have to provide what's called service loops so you can make connections before you um, put everything together on the rocket. But again, the basic premise is keep your wire lengths as short as possible. And none of these techniques are particularly expensive or difficult. Uh, even if you don't shield your wiring, just twisting it is a good start to eliminate the problem. Uh, be, also, be aware of your surroundings. Um, you know, separate emitters. Uh, digital systems are noisy. You know, I, I'm old school using the basic stamps. You have Arduinos, Raspberry Pis. Uh, again, they're computers. They are generally noisy. Separate transmitting and receiving uh, antennas. You may have telemetry and beacons on board for finding your, radio, your rockets. You may have receivers on board. For example, a lot of cases have GPS. All of the um, America Cup applications have uh, GPS. So keep those separate. Also during your preps, you know, remember that your are radi radiators external to your rocket, uh, especially when you're handling bare pyrotechnics uh, and black powder. Uh, so during ground checkout and preparation, you're potentially in a less controlled area like a parking lot. Uh, mobile transceivers uh, can have much higher power. Uh, you might want to note if there's a vehicle nearby that has what I call an antenna farm, like this vehicle does in the picture. You know, in some cases, a low power, a relatively low power uh, six meter system might just be 50 watts but that's still at least 10 times what you're gonna have in a handheld uh, radio. So just keep in mind during your preparations, be aware of what's around you. The reasons for twisted pairs, uh, basically the voltage uh, that is received, it's the length times the width of the loop. And what you're trying to do is minimize the loop area uh, and you have canceling induced currents and voltage. Uh, shielding, uh, aluminum foil. When we're doing testing in the field, we buy rolls and rolls of aluminum foil and wrap it around our harnessing that connects the uh, unit under test to the test equipment. Uh, it's cheap, it's easy, and it conforms to shapes. Uh, we also use a lot of copper foil. Uh, it has the advantage of being solderable, um, but it's not as available and it is more expensive. Metal tapes are available, uh, stainless steel, copper, and aluminum, especially stainless steel and aluminum. You can typically find it in uh, automotive stores for repair of automobiles. Uh, copper tape is more of a specialty item uh, and again, some of the tapes that are best for this application have conductive adhesives. Another alternative is not intended for shielding, but it will work. There are self-adhesive hobby foils that are for model building. Uh, I've used in the past copper hobby foils that were designed to simulate the copper bottoms of ships and boats. Uh, but that would work perfectly for shielding around smaller areas on uh, model rockets and it's lightweight. Uh, 
one thing, if you're using various types of shields, it's not a good idea to have different metals in contact. Uh, you'll create a, a, actually kind of a battery for galvanic corrosion. Since our rockets typically don't last for years on end, it's not as big a problem, but it's still not good practice, be advised. And also if you're shielding your equipment, make sure that the shields are not touching the circuitry because you can short stuff out. Uh, just as an example, over on the right, you'll see that there is the Wi-Fi module there. Uh, it's not unusual like on GPSs and Wi-Fis that those devices themselves are, um, cer are certified like part 15. So they are inside their own shielded area. And that is one of the best ways to minimize electromagnetic interference. Uh, one of the things too, as we've talked about how to prevent stuff is testing. In the world of the military rockets, we spend a lot of magnetic compatibility, both uh, what we call inter-system and intra-system uh, compatibility. We'll turn on all of the components within the missile. Uh, we'll go ahead and see that they play well with each other in the missile because the missile has various uh, transmitters and various receivers on board. We wanna make sure they are playing well together. And then we'll also, if it's an air launched missile, we'll place it on an airplane, we'll power up the various aircraft systems, we'll power up the various missile systems, and again, we'll make sure that everything is playing well together. Basically, you're gonna turn on every device until all the systems are operating. Try to have your representative flight layout because if proximity is a problem, you wanna know it. My recommended turn on order is to turn on the noisiest devices and most, well, turn on the most susceptible devices first because they need the time for their power on self-test and bootstrapping like the onboard computers, the GPS, you might wanna let it get its first fix before turning on other equipment, the digital logic circuits like your recovery uh, electronics and altimeters, video systems, electromechanical servo systems, and then transmitters. Again, the idea is let your most sensitive systems stabilize themselves and confirm all your systems are working as expected and find a sequence and stick to it uh, because you don't know if you start changing the sequence, how it may affect how things start up or affect each other. And with that, uh, we got about 15 minutes left for questions. I'm gonna stop the PowerPoint and I'm going over basically to the um, control panel screen. And I'm gonna, have not received any questions. I hoping folks are still out there. Yeah, just one thing I see from Matthew that he had a question on the chat. Um, I'll ask everybody if you have questions, um, try to use uh, the Q&A uh, tab uh, as opposed to the uh, chat tab because I can respond on the Q&A tab. The other thing I'm gonna set up also in the background, I'm gonna to get to your question in a moment, Matthew, is I'm gonna launch a poll here. I'm just looking to, for feedback on this presentation. So please uh, you know, provide input to the poll. And we'll go back to the chat. So Matthew, um, EMI, is it possible? G GPS, less so because GPS, other than the, whatever noise it creates internally processing the signals, it doesn't have a lot of power on its outputs. On the other hand, you said uh, other signals. Uh, yeah, definitely, depending upon what's on board your rocket. For example, if you have telemetry on board, uh, that definitely can interfere. 
Uh, and yes, it does have to do with some of the frequencies because if the altimeter is a digital device, it probably has a clock internally. If you start to crosstalk with the clock on the um, uh, on your uh, other electronics, yes, you can cause those electronics to malfunction. So again, I would keep GPS separated because it is a low power system. It is a receiver. The altimeter, yes, it can be affected by the other devices in your rocket. And that's why I said you need to do your EMC testing and bring everything up and make sure, uh, at least on the ground uh, and your internal sources in the rocket, that you're not having issues. Uh, give me just a feedback either in the Q&A or uh, on the chat, Matthew, that I addressed your question. Uh, also want to just say hi to Hamish uh, from Australia. Uh, he may recognize uh, some of the picture there. That was the spaceship van in my photo was in Australia. I was down there for Thunder Down Under both 2015 and 2019. Enjoyed uh, Australia. Uh, so looking at Daniel Bennett, are there any cases of a propulsion system of a rocket causing interference? Not that I know of. Um, and we have, I've never been involved with any, say, rocket, with rocket motor stuff uh, interfering. Uh, it is an ionized trail potentially behind the rocket. So things like lightning can follow the exhaust trail, but I am not aware of any actual interference. Oh, uh, let's see here. So Matthew, okay. I, I think I got Daniel. Uh, Matthew responded. Uh, Steve Taylor, we're moving on to the next speaker. So again, uh, I thought I still have a couple minutes left. Um, different power sources. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm shut off yet. Um, Steve Taylor, are we going to go to 12 o'clock or do I need to shut down? Uh, he's the organizer, so I've got to take Steve's messages. Uh, Nathaniel uh, was talking about different power sources for controls. If I control valves from 24 volts, volts and I use the same power source for other uh, buses, yes, it could be a problem. Uh, what we do typically uh, many times on missiles, we will divorce what's called pulse load uh, loads from continuous loads. So things like our guidance and logic circuitry, which is continuous in its pull basically, we have on its own power source, things like uh, fin controls, electromagnetic actuators, pyrotechnics, we would put on a pulse load bus. And uh, this way, as they switch on and off and create any noise, uh, they are not interfering with the constantly on electronics. I would separate the power if you can, it could be a problem. Again, uh, just a thumbs up if I answered your question, it would be appreciated. Uh, and uh, I'm just looking, I'm gonna check the Q&A tab. I have uh, from Madison, have you noticed any commonly used strategies to make rocketry that usually fail when teams try to implement them? Not really. Uh, because everything I'm doing is basic, uh, suggesting here is essentially industry practice. It applies to model rockets as much as it applies to military and NASA systems. Uh, things like twisted pairs, shielding. Now, if you're not well executed on those, yes, I mean, we've had people where shielding is an art. It's a little bit more difficult in one respect in our rockets because of how things are grounded. We have metal structures in our uh, military missiles um, that are conductive, so we can, it acts as a shield unto itself. Uh, you can actually generate currents within shields if they're not properly grounded. So the overall strategy, never a problem that I've seen. 
specific implementation of those strategies, especially shielding? The answer is yes, it has failed. Uh, again, looking for feedback that I've answered your question. Okay. Um, and I believe, Matthew, that the presentation was recorded and it should be available for later review. Uh, so I won't be sending the slides out, but it should be available for review. And uh, got more receipts here. I'll just give it a minute or two more uh, for any questions. I'll look at the chat and the Q&A. Prefer the Q&A side for questions. And uh, other than that, I don't have anything else to present. Uh, Steve, if you want to come on, Steve Taylor, if you want to come on board and uh, well, basically we can shut this down. Okay, having said that and last call, I think I got everybody's questions here and I am going to go ahead and stop sharing. I just want to thank everybody who attended this session. Uh, your feedback is appreciated and good luck and good flying. Thank you again.